So very good morning to all of you all. I'm going to talk about PCL tibial bony avulsion fractures. We know that PCL injuries constitute about 20% of knee ligament injuries, and tibial avulsion is a part of its spectrum. The mechanism of injury is typically a dashboard injury and very common in developing countries because of two-wheeler related injuries. Relevant anatomy-wise, we have to understand that the PCL inserts 10 millimeter inferior or 10 millimeters post, uh, distal to the articular surface behind the tibia, and this is going to be relevant when we are going to pick up these fractures on X-rays and CT scans. Typically, as I said, it's a dashboard injury. A posterior adductor force comes onto the tibia when it is flexed to 90 degrees. Typically, these patients will have an anterior abrasion on the knee, and an examination, they will have posterior instability signs, basically the posterior drawer, the posterior sag, and the quadriceps active test. On X-rays, it could be easily missed, but if you have a fine eye, you could just pick up a lytic line around the intercondylar region. The lateral X-ray is going to be diagnostic because it picks up the focal discontinuity. Very important, you have to understand that if you can see the tibial avulsion of the PCL on a lateral X-ray, that means the displacement is directly 10 millimeters and more, because any displacement less than 10 millimeters will not be seen on a lateral X-ray. And thus, a CT scan is going to be important to see the amount of displacement, combination and any associated tibial plateau fractures. The MRI is basically going to show us the intactness of the PCL ligament and show us associated injuries which we see up to 17% in these fractures. Classification, we have a parallel classification like ACL avulsion. Type 1 are the undisplaced. Type 2 is where the anterior hinge is intact and the displacement is only posterior. And type 3 are the completely displaced fractures. Management depends on the type, so it depends on the displacement of the fracture fragment the size of the fragment, the amount of combination, and the concomitant injuries that we have. Non-operative treatment is indicated for type 1 or undisplaced fracture, or the displacement is less than 5 millimeters, and there is no instability or a grade 1 posterior instability. So the basic principle is to pr prevent any posterior sag of the tibia. So you take these patients into a dynamic anterior drawer brace, start active quadriceps strengthening and passive hamstring stretching. By four to eight weeks, you can start weight bearing in the brace, and eight to 12 weeks, they can pre resume pre-injury level of activities. Operative indication is basically type two and type three fractures where the displacement is more than 10 millimeters, and these patients usually have a grade two or grade three instability. And we need to fix them because immobilization fails to reduce a fragment, we cannot manipulate the fragment closed, and these then lead to non-union and posterior instability. So the flowchart we follow for operative treatment is reduction and fixation. We can do the reduction either open, we can go medial through the gastroc, through the gastroc or lateral, and we can do the reduction arthroscopic. And fixation can be used using a plethora of devices, starting from K-wires, tension bands, suture anchors, and sutures. So I'm going to first give you a short video on how we go about doing an open fixation. So the patient is in prone position, the knee is flexed at about 20 degrees. A hockey stick incision is taken, starting about a centimeter distal to the popliteal crease, and then the incision goes distally medial to the medial gastrocnemus in the interval between the medial head of the gastroc and the semimembranosus. The skin incision is taken, and we dissect down to the gastroc fascia. Once the gastroc fascia is exposed, it is incised in direction with the skin incision and this exposes the medial head of the gastrocnemus. The medial head of the gastrocnemus is easily dissected using finger dissection of the posterior aspect of the tibia. And the medial gastroc is retracted laterally, and this takes away all the neurovascular bundles laterally, giving you a direct exposure of the posterior aspect of the tibia and your avulsion fracture. We identify the geniculate vessel, which can be very clearly seen and then we identify where the region of the PCL fossa avulsion. So that's the artery, and that's the region of the PCL fracture. A capsulotomy, inverted L-shaped capsulotomy is done posteriorly, and this takes us directly onto the fracture crater. Once the fracture is identified, the fracture crater can be prepared using a burr or a periosteal elevator. We provisionally reduce the fracture, and many times I would use an ethymon stitch through the PCL ligament to pull it back into the crater, specifically in chronic cases where we cannot get the reduction. Once the reduction is obtained, we fix it with a K-wire or a guide wire. So my assistant is keeping the reduction maintained, and I pass a K-wire or a guide wire through the fracture bed, and it goes directed anterolaterally. Confirm the position on CM, AP, and lateral. Ream this wire with a 3.2 mm drill bit, and final fixation is done with a 4cc 
screw with a washer. So this would be the final product. Closure is very simple. The gas stock medial head falls back onto the entire surgical dissection. We close the fascia, subcute, and the skin. So that's after closure. And that's the final x-ray with good reduction and good implant position. Arthroscopic, I use the double suture bridge technique. I use panel anesthesia on all these stations with a high thigh tourniquet. I use the standard anterolateral portal, the standard anteromedial portal to work anteriorly, and an anteromedial incision through which the drilling of tunnels is done. Two posterior medial portals are used, a high posterior medial portal, which is about two centimeters above the joint line, and a low anteromedial portal through which a 5mm cannula is going to go in. At the time of diagnostic arthroscopy, the ACL is found to be floppy because the tibia has sagged posteriorly because of the incompetent uh, posterior cruciate ligament. Two windows are dissected on either side of the PCL, which I label as a medial and the lateral PCL window because these two windows will be used to work behind the knee. We then advance into the posteromedial compartment through the medial PCL window, and then we create a two posteromedial portals using the out-to-in technique. The inferior or the lower posteromedial portal will house a 5.5 mm cannula through which all suture management would be done, and the scope will be stationed on the high posteromedial portal so we get a bird's eye view of the entire fracture management. A PCL elevator is then passed through the lateral PCL window, progressed into the posterior compartment, and is used to separate the posterior capsule from the fragment, fracture fragment. Arthroscopic shaver is then used to remove the synovium, and slowly you can start identifying the frag fracture fragment and the fracture crater. So this is the kind of vision that you would get arthroscopically from the posterior medial portal, where the fragment and the fracture crater can be very easily and very clearly identified in magnification and good illumination. The fracture crater is then prepared using a burr and arthroscopic shaver, removing any fibrous tissue, specifically in chronic cases. And then a PCL jig is used to drill two tunnels, lateral and medial, in relation to the fracture crater. And this drilling is done from the anteromedial tibial incision. These two wires are then over-reamed with an endoscopic reamer, protecting the wires from progressing posteriorly Thus, this procedure becomes very safe from any possible posterior neurovascular injury. Following this, a number two fiber loaded on an arthroscopic knot pusher is looped around the PCL. The other end is then turned around the PCL and retrieved, thus encircling the PCL at its ligament and bone junction. And then a series of four to five half inches are pushed into the joint and these half inches lie on the bony fragment posteriorly. The same steps are repeated for a second number two fiber wire, thus creating two knot bundles posterior to the PCL bony fragment. Two suture shuttles are then advanced into the posterior compart of the knee, and these two suture shuttles are used to pull one suture of each into the anterior compartment. As the two sutures are then cinched, you'll see that the two knot bundles nicely compress the PCL fragment into its fracture crater, giving anatomical reduction and very stable fixation. The sutures are then tied on a bone bridge anteromedially. And you see, as we tighten it, the fragment falls back into its fracture crater. So that's the final product or the final repair. Two suture bridges posterior to the knee, pressing the fragment into its fracture crater, giving a very robust fixation. Then we, once you go into the anterior compartment, the ACL is nice and taut because the tibial sag has been corrected, and you can see the fibers looped at the junction of the PCL ligament and the bony fragment. Rehab-wise, we keep these patients in a long knee brace with a posterior calf pad. I start knee bending almost immediately. Full weight bearing is starting around four weeks, and without brace at two months, and these patients return to their sporting activity by about six months post-operatively. So this is a 35 male coming with a completely displaced tibial PCL avulsion fracture was fixed arthroscopically. You can see the reduction and the bony tunnels drilled. Healing usually occurs at two months post-operatively. See, the open technique has advantages that doesn't need arthros arthroscopic skills, which, is, which has a steep learning curve. You don't need expensive equipment and can be done by a trauma surgeon. The arthroscopic technique has the advantage of not handling the neurovascular structures. You can assess the status of the PC ligament and tackle all intra-articular pathology. And you see everything very magnified and good illumination. 
Fixation wise, we can use screws, K wires, and suture anchors. But the problem with screws is if it is a comminuted fragment, it can back out. The reason being the PCL fragment is usually comminuted, it's a swivel of bone. There is fracture bad. The metal can affect future imaging and future knee surgery. And thus, we prefer sutures because they give surface hold. It does not involve drilling the fragment, secure cortical fixation, it gives tension band, and doesn't require removal or doesn't affect any future imaging. The double suture technique basically is a very robust construct because it keeps the PCL taut, taking care of the plastic deformation, gives uniform fragment compression, prevents suture cutout, and prevents suture slippage, thus giving very secure fixation. And thus, I feel the suture arthroscopic technique gives very effective fixation of these tibial PCL bony avulsions. Thank you.